Oh, let me ask. Let me ask all you. Uh, and we have more vocalists, right? All you non-vocalists. Um, how many of you know the lyrics to the songs that you play? That's fair. That's a fair answer. Because um, I'm, I'm probably a little. I'm a little more than. I'm probably like. <laughs> I'm probably at 75, you know, 75 to 80, you know. Um, I'm going to tell you, tell you something else that happened to me um, along the way. Um, me, like, like many, you know, hardcore jazz instrumentalist cats, I'm, you know, I'm listening to Miles and Train and... Um, Cannibal Adderley and Horace Silver and Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie and all the new school guys like you know Winton and Bradford and Walter Miller and Jerry Allen and, and Kenny Kirkland and all these people. I didn't really pay much attention to vocalists. I thought of vocalists as being like, you know, there's musicians and there's vocalists. You know, not saying vocalists aren't aren't killing. But as a teenager, I just thought of them as two separate entities, you know. Um, and then, of course, the more I started to learn about the, hist the history of jazz, I realized that this, this creek that turned into a river, that turned into an ocean between instrumentalists and vocalists, at one point uh, in our history, that didn't exist. Uh, instrumentalists knew the lyrics to every song that they played, and vocalists were able to communicate with musicians in musician speak, in, in technical speak. Um, it wasn't until the 50s where, like, you know, pop music, like, music made for teenagers, like you guys, ain't your fault. Uh, the, the big wigs that said, ah, they don't want serious music. Uh, that's when that started to go like that. Uh, hey, you just come in and sing the song. We'll have the band already pre-recorded for you. You know what I mean? Um, you don't even have to know how to sing. We got we got uh, Melodyne now. You know, just speak into the microphone. We'll tune it up for you. You know, so uh, it's gotten worse and worse through the years. So what I've um, what I discovered at some point was the importance of learning the lyric. Um, another one of my biggest heroes is, is the great Cannibal Adderley. And um, I learned an old standard called uh, Stars Fell in Alabama through Cannibal. And so when I did my first record, I recorded Stars Fell in Alabama, which was based on what I heard Cannibal do. You know, so you know, I'm, I'm like, uh, singers. 
Um, and so I remember asking Ray Brown one time, I said, hey, Pop, so like, is Frank Sinatra really that good? It looked like he wanted to take his belt off and like put me across his knee. He was like, what did you just ask me? I was like, well, I, I, what, uh, what I meant was, um, like, just how killing was Frank Sinatra? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he said, let me, he said, get this record right away. He said, get a record called Sinatra at the Sands. And uh, he says, for people who don't know, for real hardcore jazz guys who don't know anything about Frank Sinatra, that's the best record you should get. I was like, all right, cool. And uh, at some point, it started slowly sinking in. And then by, by the time I was 27, 28, man, I got hooked on vocalists. It was all about Sarah Vaughn. It was all about Ella Fitzgerald. It was all about Frank Sinatra. It was all about Nat King Cole. It was all about Carmen McRae. Uh, and, and like, you know, singers of today, like Diane Reeves and... Cassandra Wilson and Nina Freeline and I was listening to all these singers because for the first time ever I now learned the storyline to a lot of these standards that we play in the real book, you know. Um, songs like Body and Soul, songs like Misty, um, songs that we play all the time that we never pay any attention to the lyrics, you know. And so when I heard Frank Sinatra sing Star Spell on Alabama, I was so angry. I was like, oh, I wish I'd heard this first. Because now my now the version I played meant absolutely nothing. Because now I knew the lyrics, I knew the storyline, and I went back and listened to what I played, and I was <laughs> no reference for the storyline whatsoever. Almost none of what I played in terms of the melody was correct. I was embellishing Cannonball's embellishments, you know? So, you know, it gets further and further away from the source. So I say that to say, that might not be your thing right now, you know, because you know, you're you learning scales, you're learning how to groove, you're doing all this, and you know, it, you can't learn everything all at the same time. But I would urge you to, you know, whatever standards you play, listen to a vocal version of it. You know, listen, listen, listen to the lyrics, listen to the storyline, listen to what the composer intended, you know? Um, and that will prevent you from playing like Body and Soul in 11-8, you know? <laughs> because you'll know it's a love song, you know, supposed to be, you know, supposed to be sad, it's supposed to be heartfelt, you know? It's not supposed to be like some, you know, some dude fest, you know? I'm like, hey man, check it out. <laughs> You know, Johnny Green is in his grave, like, what are you doing to my song, you know? Or like, I, I remember one time, uh, so this day I never knew if he was complimenting me or not. Um, my uncle, he passed away quite some time ago. Uh, I, I did a record called Family Affair where I kind of reworked all of these, these old R&B hits. And so like the song that I really, really redid it was an old Cool in the Gang song called Open Sesame. I like completely like did this to the song to the point where it was almost unrecognizable. And I did that on purpose, right? Um, and so I played it for my uncle and uh, he said, oh man, that was killing. What, what was that? I said, you didn't recognize that? Said, no, what was that? Now my, my uncle was a hardcore R&B soul funk man. I didn't think I'd be able to get that by him. And uh, so he's, he's like, what was that? They recognize it. I said, that's cool in the game, open sesame. It was? <laughs> you know, so he said, uh, you should have just put your own name on it and kept the royalties for yourself. Because that don't sound nothing like cool in the game. <laughs> but he kind of said it like, I, I couldn't tell if, if he was complimenting me or not. So it's like, all right. <laughs> um, now, but that was one example of like what the original intent of that song was. That song was a dance song. It was a disco song. It was in the it was in the 
movie Saturday Night Fever, you know, and then I took it and said, well, let me turn this into like a 1968 Miles Davis kind of Fide Kilimanjaro kind of tune. That's fine, but you know, it's not a, probably not what Cool and the Gang had in mind when they wrote it, you know. Uh, but that was a conscious decision to do that. <laughs> you guys, when you're playing these standards, learn some vocal, some, some, some lyrics to these songs that'll help you know how to interpret the song properly. Now, by the same token, our vocalist, um, like I said, at some point in the 50s when rock and roll started getting really, really popular and it became less about the trained musician, uh, which Ella Fitzgerald was, what Sarah Vaughan was, what Carmen McRae was, what Nat King Cole was, um, almost all great vocalists at one point or another played piano. Sarah Vaughan was a great piano player. Carmen McRae was a great piano player. Not Actually, nobody knows Diane Reeves is a really killing piano player. Uh, Diana Krall is a great piano player. Um, so, when you go to a jam session and a vocalist sits in and the vocalist says, let's do My Funny Valentine. What has happened in the last half century which never happened at one point, is the, the, the vocalist will say, I don't know. Like, you, don't know you don't know what key you sing a song in. Mm -mm. Well, here's my first note. Uh, and then the, the rest of the band has to do it for you and figure out the key. Fine. Um, that's where all the vocalist musician jokes started, you know. Um, you turn to the vocalist and say, okay, we'll, we'll, you sing the melody, we'll take two courses, and then we'll take it from the bridge out. Many vocalists will go, what's that mean? And to a, a, a trained musician, they're going, how can you not know something simple like that? You know. Um, so I also would urge vocalists to learn as much about the music as you possibly can. Um, because we want to get rid of that ocean, you know. Um, Chick Corea loves to tell this story about when he played with Sarah Vaughan. And he was playing the wrong chord or something, you know, when playing the right changes. And Sarah Vaughan came up behind him on the piano, put her hands over Chick's shoulder and said, no baby, it's like this, you know. <laughs> I think all vocalists used to be able to do that at one point. You know, he, I, I got all these outtakes from all these old Frank Sinatra records. So you hear Frank Sinatra saying, uh, "Hey, trombones, I think there's there's a wrong note somewhere. I think maybe it's in uh, trombone three. Sounds like he's playing a G natural. Maybe it should be something else. Like try a G flat." I'm going, "Damn, you got Frank? All right, Frank." <laughs> Trump on three. He nailed it. He whittled it down, you know. Um, vocalists should also be musicians as well. So you should be able to do that. And you guys should know, know the lyrics to all, all the songs you play. Any more questions before we uh, jam on something?